Whenever you're ready, we hot. Yep. All right, cool. Well, today we've got uh, Matt Park with us, a um, good buddy of mine, and uh, got to know each other over the last year or so, and had him out to the uh, family's place at the ranch there a couple times, and uh, having a good time, and have uh, become pretty close to this dude, and good, great guy. A uh, little bit of uh, background, this is, uh, say, TCU royalty. <laughs> <laughs> he is a Hall of Famer. TCU Hall of Fame baseball player, uh, uh, former MLB player, and introduce Matt. Tell us a little bit about born, raised, and kind of went through there. And I mean, you don't have to go too far into detail of your your personal life, but give us some background here. Yeah, um, born and raised in East Texas, uh, Lufkin, so about an hour south of Tyler. Um, my whole clan's still there. My mom was one of six. So I've got cousins that stretch across uh, the Piney Woods uh, everywhere. Um, <clears throat> so I grew up there. Um, then when uh, I got to high school, my dad got transferred. He worked for UPS for 45 years. He got transferred to Houston. And so we had to move, you know, pick up, move, uh, move to Houston. Uh, I went to high school there, Klein High School uh, in Spring, Texas. Cool. Uh, loved it there. It was great. Um, and then I ended up uh, going to TCU. Now, getting to TCU was a little bit different route than most. Um, you know, both – signing with TCU and then also even stepping on campus so I wasn't even originally going to get go to TCU didn't think about it you know I think there may have been a <clears throat> an offer in there somewhere yeah. right out of yeah. high school to maybe play for a local right yeah yeah that, MLB team here in North Texas yeah that part of it too but even just to sign to be committed to TCU right. um they called me the first day under Randy Mazie he's a head coach of West Virginia now called me the first day of recruiting because that was back when they only started like the sophomore going into or the summer going into junior year and he was like, hey, I have a TCU. I'm like, nah, um, I got it. And so I actually didn't even think about it. Um, only reason I ended up going on a visit to TCU is because my visit at North Carolina fell through. Okay. Like the day I was supposed to go to North Carolina, dropped out. Just dropped. Coach Fox called me and said, hey, can't, you know, this is what we can offer you scholarship wise. I'm like, coach, I understand respect, but I was like, I've got better offers at other schools. How can I convince my parents to pay you money? When I have schools yeah. that are that you know, I was like, Doesn't I just make any sense. I was like, I can't do that. I can't ask them to pay more money for me to go here just because. So, and he understood. And so, it actually crazy enough. First call I made after that called Arkansas. I said, hey, I'd love to come because that was a time you know Arkansas or was a premier back. Yeah, back. premier program. Their facilities were you know arguably the best in the country across the board. Called them, uh, assistant coach like absolutely, we'll get you up here. Uh, let me talk to Van Horn. Van Horn calls me back two minutes later. He goes, hey. Sorry, we you know we're just not gonna not gonna bring you up. You're not going to college. Don't worry about it. Like we're not gonna waste our time. Go, All right, call TCU. I said, hey, you know this is Friday. You know typically these visits you go out on a Thursday. It's Friday. I go, yeah. hey, can I come up? They're like, absolutely. And so come on. I drove up. I drove up. Jumped in the tour mid tour. Like we were halfway through Slosh, the campus. Slosh's coach there. <laughs> yeah, Slosh is the coach there. Yeah. I jump in halfway through the tour. And that was like, you know, I missed most of it and all that kind of stuff came up. But had I had some good friends there that were playing there or going to be there the next year. And so kind of fit up. And then I realized, hey, this is a special place. It's really cool. I'm going to be here. So even signing with TCU to begin with, I wasn't didn't have it even a re- remote, uh, remote uh, possibility for me early on. And then, yeah, um, so then I get through my senior year and I get drafted in the first round by the Rangers. Um, you know, and at the time, freaking awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. Dream come true. It was really cool. I got to meet Nolan um, through some private workouts and talk to him, and my family talked to him. And he was actually the one that called us. So the day of the draft, you know, because it started usually in the afternoon, we got a call about 10 o'clock in the morning, and he was like, Listen, we love Matt. We want Matt. If we pick him, we will, we want to sign him. Like, we know the number. We want to sign him if we take him. If we don't take him, it's not because we don't want him, it's because we can't pay. They were in a transition period. This was 2010-ish? This is, this is 2009. This uh, is 2009. before it came out okay. that they went bankrupt. Gotcha. So this is this is still everything's fine, no problems, whatever, because this is in June, and I think they filed for bankruptcy in July. Right. Um, and so they're like, but if we don't pick him, it's because we can't pay. Right. Not that we don't like him, but we can't pay him. Yeah. So four hours later, comes around, I get a phone call. Hey, you're going to be a Texas Ranger. Awesome. Everyone super pumped, right? I don't hear anything from him for two months. Because oh, at wow. this time, it was the r- different rules were – that if you sign an above slot contract, because there was no aggregate pool, it was just wild, wild west. Guys were signing for a million, two million dollars in the seventh round. That just it didn't matter. Sure. Like just wherever you were picked, you could pick whatever number. Um, and so, but if you were going to sign above a slot deal, 
it couldn't be done until the deadline because they didn't want teams or players using other deals to negotiate with. Okay. They weren't going to say, "Hey, this guy, he was a second overall pick. Well, he signed for three million dollars. I don't, you know, why? Why should we give you more?" And that kind of stuff. So that's why they did it to where it was a deadline. So the deadline wasn't until mid-August. So I didn't hear from him for two months. First time they come in, half. Really? Half. Walked in my door. I remember just vividly Rusty Greer walks into my door, and he's just like, this is the most we've ever given anyone. This is the highest we've ever paid, you know, high school prospect. Like, And I was like, oh, okay. And, like, my agent was with me at the time. He's like, that, I, what do you want us to do with this? Like, yeah. So that didn't happen. And then coincidentally enough, a week later is, like, deadline. And so I'm up in Arlington. Well, I'm bouncing between – Ranger Stadium and TCU. TCU, yeah. yeah. I'm at, I'm at <laughs> TCU area, hanging out with my teammates. Like, right. hey, yeah. And, then, and you know, the guys even, they told me afterwards, like, we, we didn't expect you to come. Like, we just knew you were up here just to hang out and, like, not be over there. So I'm just sitting there. We're going back and forth, back and forth. Well, we get to the – at the time, because it's midnight, is the deadline, um, so 11 o'clock Central. And we get there and just – they basically the most they were going to give me was was uh, about two thirds what I was supposed to what we agreed to, right. and I told them I said I, I can't. They're like, well, you know, the money's in the big leagues, you can make it all then. I was telling them, like, well, I don't know if I'm ever going to have this opportunity again because right. I could get hurt tomorrow. Yeah. So I have to maximize what I think is my value, and also it was kind of a thing like if you tell me you're going to do something, let's do it because right. that's what I'm going to do. I I told you I'm going to show up and I'm going to be ready to play and all that stuff. So it's kind of a principal thing, but also like I can't just take a discount. And then hope that I make it back at the back end. Sure. There's no guarantees. I mean, the the crazy part that I try to convince and talk to parents about is of first round high school athletes, five percent of them make it to the big leagues. Right. Five percent of first rounders. First round. And how many high school kids are drafted? Yeah. Like tons, right? right? They're taking all, but five percent of the ones that are taken in the first 32 picks make it to the big leagues. So. You can't sit there and say I'm going to get another shot at this. Right. I, I, I should. The odds are not in your favor to make it. Yeah. So you know. So that happens, and sure enough, it was 11 o'clock hits. We don't have a deal done. I drive home to Houston. I grab my stuff. Next morning, I'm at TCU because class on starts phone. on Monday. Yep. Class starts on. I'm, I moved in within six, like eight hours of saying I'm not going to. The, I'm not going to play professional baseball, but I got to get in my dorm because tomorrow's class. Was Slosh happy to see you? Yeah, 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 he was happy to see me. Um, it was a, like so that was a weird period, but I mean, I, 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 you know, I've told people don't like don't follow my plan. It's, you got to make a personal decision. I made a decision that I was convicted in, sure. that I believed in. I and I felt that there was also and also for me, I'll say. I was a draft eligible sophomore, right? So I wasn't going to college for three years. I knew I could go for two right. years and be done. Two so years. it helped me to where I was like, yeah, I can go play my freshman year, then be draft my sophomore year, and I can get out of here. So that helped a lot too, just because of my age. Is but that still the same? Is it still minimum one year? Or I, for some reason, I could think it was minimum two. But it, so it's three years. It's uh, when you turn twenty-one, basically, is your age. Okay. Um, so you have to have three years in college, and so you'll have guys that are still draft eligible sophomores. Um, you know, and now it's a little bit different because the draft has moved back and the signing period is so much shorter because, uh -huh. it, you know, now it's there's no, like, there's deals that go above it, but they have that aggregate pool and they can spend it however you want. So you can draft a guy second overall the next day, sign him for whatever you want, and it doesn't matter because everyone's pool is different as far as money goes. So it doesn't, you, there's no really negotiating back and forth. So it's a little bit shorter. So now you have more guys because the draft is now instead of June, it's in July that, that can fall in that el drop, that sophomore eligibility. But it's kind of rare. I mean, you don't hear about a ton of them. TCU's got one this year, shortstop Anthony Silva. Like, he's going to get drafted and he's going to leave TCU. Mm -hmm. And he was only there for two years. Sure. But, you know, you just try to get the value you can out of them. So that helped a lot. But I, yeah, I tell people all the time, like, don't, that this is not normal. Like, this is not a normal thing. And right. I was like, you know, you will never hear of a sports franchise going bankrupt. Never. You, yeah. That will never happen again. Happen. That will never happen again. These things, I mean, all these teams are worth billions of dollars. They will never go bankrupt again. And it's, right. it is nuts that that was the timing <clears throat> that it happened. And it just, I happen to be, just kind of <laughs> be in the, the middle of it. Right. Yeah, so which is sometimes people forget, like when they talk about, like, oh, yeah, you did, you turned out all the money. I go, you do realize they were bankrupt, right? And like MLB was cashing their checks, like, oh. It was right there in that transition. Uh -huh. It was it was yeah. a strange it was a strange time. Yeah, I mean, I played with a guy, two, two or three guys later on, teammates of mine that played for the Rangers at the time. And, yeah, their checks were signed by MLB. It was totally different. Like, they were getting hard checks. Right. They weren't getting deposits anymore. It was like physical yeah, checks because – that the you know Tom Hicks was bankrupt and so it was it, like I said there's a lot of weird stuff that happened in that time period. So you, your sophomore year mm -hmm. and you're how far in on your sophomore year at TCU? 
year. Yeah, so I was, I had finished, so I went, for, you know, had my freshman year, we went to the College World Series, which, you know, that also played into me going to colleges, want to do something that had never been done, which that was the first time TCU had ever done it. Right. Um, you know, get through my sophomore year, um, going into the draft, conversations, you know, I got hurt, um, I had some shoulder issues coming out of my freshman year, because to be honest, I just threw a ton between getting ready to be drafted, to going into pro ball, to then pitching for my entire you know freshman year and we, I mean, we played all the way into late june right That's and so like i pitched a ton and threw a ton and so you know coming out I was, I was just tired my shoulder was a little weak from just from the workload so i had a little bit of that stuff so going in the draft it was a little different it was you know hey teams still like you you know that kind of stuff we know what you can do and right and what's crazy enough is i didn't know i got drafted by the nationals i was on the phone with my with slosh because, um, you know, I talked to teams, and some of them were talking about the first round, second round, or comp round, or whatever. And I was like, that's fine. And then we get to the third round, and I hadn't heard anything. I could call and slosh. I was like, hey, where am I going to play summer ball? Because I'm coming back for another year, and I'm going to show literally all these people that they're, you know. They're crazy. Yeah. That I, that, what are we doing? Fast. And when he – and I'm telling the phone, he goes, oh, by the way, congrats on getting drafted. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, you just got picked by the Nationals. Sure enough, as soon as that happened, he says that, I get a phone call like, hey, we're taking you. Yeah, I was like, I didn't even know. So I didn't know I got drafted by the Nationals. This was in the third round? Third round. round. Okay. Yep, third round. So I was at third round, um, and the reason that they took me there was that was still a protected pick. So if I didn't sign, they would get that pick back again. The uh, Under the new old rules, they would get that pick again. Um, and that was kind of their reasoning. And so, yeah, I got picked by them, and then they came to me and, and – um, we're like, hey, you know, one, they're going to offer me a big league contract, which doesn't happen anymore. You can't do that. Right. Um, and they're like, this is the amount of money. I'm like, perfect. Yeah, let's do it. They're like, look, we're going to take a risk. I think that draft was between the first four picks. So they had two first rounders, a comp, and uh, a sandwich picker than me. I think we would. that was the year that they took Rendon sixth overall. Okay. And so, and I had known Anthony for a long time, but the guys that we took, I mean, they spent a ton of money in that. And they're like, look, we're just like, that was kind of their MO with the Nationals at the time was like, we're going to spend money and, and invest in high upside people and see what happens. And so it was great. I didn't expect it, to be honest. I thought I was going back to TCU just based on all that stuff, but right. it was a great deal. And, and so I'm very fortunate, very thankful. Um, you know, regret that I didn't get to show the Nationals value as much as I wanted to because of my injuries. But, you know, at the end of the day, they gave me my chance and they helped me out a lot. Okay. So you, how long were you in the MLB? So I played professionally between minor leagues and major leagues for a little over a decade. Okay. So 2011 is when I started, and I retired in COVID, uh, okay. when COVID hit because baseball was done. And, yeah. and I had, my second daughter had just been born, and it was just, you know, it was kind of chasing a dream. You know, at that point, you get to a certain point where if you've made it into the big leagues and you're kind of in that, you know, category of between AAA and the majors and stuff like that, Sometimes it's just you know you got to look at it and say hey do I want to keep doing this do I want to stay this road away? game is a lot of it's right. a lot of work yeah I don't see my I don't see my <laughs> kids family. yeah I don't see my kids I don't see my wife like what am I what am I what am I doing it for and so you know and and also like I knew I had two years of school left so I was like if I keep playing I'm just pushing this back further and further you know so so that was a so I played a little over ten years and then when COVID hit I was like you know what it's time for me to make a transition I got to go back to school not excited to be 30 years old you right. know in school right. but but uh but yeah so that was it was a good it was for me i say that that period allowed me the opportunity to do it without having to say i can't i'm just saying no because there was no baseball to be played for that year yeah um so it helped out a lot i know you and i have <clears throat> discussed that because you probably know more movie quotes than anybody I've ever met in my life i've and, had a lot of bus rides and uh, there was the, the bus rides and the traveling and everything else just lends itself to a lot of uh -huh. movie time uh -huh. so that's 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 pretty cool yeah um so after you know a decade later you go back go back to tcu they said yeah you know come on finish up your your degree and we want you to kind of help here back here in the bullpen yeah it's kind of yeah no i uh so the first call i made when i kind of made the decision to go back to to retire was i called slosh because he was still the head coach at tcu at the time i said hey I'm coming back. Uh, I'm done. Is there an opportunity for me to be on staff as an undergraduate? And he goes, yeah, so 100%, come back. And he's always been great about that. And Kirk is the same way now. The head coach at TCU is, if you're a former player of theirs, man, they, they want you back around yeah. the program because they know they you are basically their best selling yeah, point. Exactly. Because you talk the talk, you walk the walk, you, you, you are the you embodiment. Know, you know the inside. Right, and the guys look at you as, you know, a peer. You know, since even this though guy these, was here, he did it. Right. This is what I want to do. I want to I do what he did. Yeah, yeah, and so they look at you like you're a peer of theirs, and so you're able to have that relationship, which I was very fortunate. Um, so Slosh let me come back. It was uh, definitely different, um, just seeing the mechanics of what goes into 
running a program from that side of it versus the player side of it. Because the player side, you know, I remember it was long days. We got up, we lifted a bunch of weights. I went to class, I went to practice, did my thing. Well, you know, being on the coach's side, I was there more longer than I was as a player. Right. You know, doing yeah, stuff you had all to be the there time. Before players got there to be there after. Yeah, players and so on. and I was going to class at the same time. So sure. like, guys, I don't. You know, like, listen, I'm here early in the morning. I got practice, just like you guys have practice. I got stuff. So yeah. it was it was definitely different to see that, and, and it, it gave me a greater appreciation for coaches. Mm -hmm. And what that goes into that, um, and what it takes to plan a three-hour practice, what it takes to you know work on travel, getting guys from you know TCU, you know we're for, they're fortunate enough, and I was fortunate enough that we always traveled really well. You know we would take a lot of flights, we would take you know really nice you know nice travel and accommodations for us, but the mechanics of getting all that together. Yeah, there's a lot you, of background to you it. You have no <laughs> idea as a player. Sure. You're 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 in your own bubble, and you just think about, well, I got to be at practice, you know, this time, whatever. It's like, no, everyone's here before, after, and, and during. So a ton of planning. Yeah, and so it was really good to see that side of it, um, you know, and, and being able to do that, and also it gave me an outlet. So I didn't go, you know, cold turkey away from baseball, turn into civilian life. You know, I was able to have that outlet of being there, and and honestly, it was one of the, some of the coolest times and coolest years that I've ever had, and just being able to be around. 18 to 21 year olds, watch them chase their dreams and be able just to be a part of their story, a little bit part of it, um, was really, really cool. You know, and, and like you said, the developed uh, work ethic that you had picked up. I mean, you obviously started at a very young age to get to where you did, you know, through the uh, all the way through and then back to uh, help mentor that. And uh, I know that you are now also helping with uh, the high school. Um, I don't know if we're allowed to say. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. South, we're at Southwest Christian mm -hmm. there, and, um, which is awesome. We've got some family members that go there as well, and uh, very cool. I mean, to to keep continuing that, pass that on. Yeah, I mean, it was you know. So my kids started at Southwest Christian last year mm -hmm. uh, with my oldest, um, and it's kind of one of those things. You know, I've got three little girls, so I'm probably going to be there for the next two and a half decades. Yeah. And so I'm like, hey. I'm going to be around, I'm so, in. you know, I got, and, you know, and I'm fortunate enough to where I, I do have the opportunity to, to have some time to dedicate to it, and so, you know, that was kind of one of my things. I was like, hey, if we're going to be here, and, and, and Southwest Christian does a great job of this, is it's a family um, really driven school yeah. that it's not just drop your kids off, pick your kids up. Right. It's like, hey, how do we, how do we get involved? How do we help? How can we invest in this school, invest in these kids? And so, for me, it was like that, that kind of you know, stance or mantra that they have, I was like, okay, well, I can help in this world. Right. Now they got to be able to let me do it. Sure. Uh, which, you know, and I'd helped in the past in the off seasons when I was still playing professionally. Um, you know, Tracy Howard, who's now the athletic director there, he was actually the head baseball coach at the time. So I would go out and I would do practices and stuff. And so when I got back into it and our girls started there, you know, I got connected with Coach uh, Rusty Beam, who is a phenomenal, phenomenal man. Um, if you have a young, if you have a young athlete, you want them to play for Rusty because he understands what's important mm -hmm. he understands the value of what baseball gives you but also he understands that life is way more important than what we're going to do on the field and that's something that he constantly instills in these kids and invests in them that it's not just about what we can do inside the inside the white lines it's what can we do outside, outside of, it. of it and so you know got connected with him he said absolutely love to have you know and so um you know and then we got to i talked to tracy about it and he was like yeah it's like so you know i'm just the old guy that gets to hang around <laughs> you know um and so i come in and out as much as i can and and they've given me that freedom of just hey when when you can be here be here and and it's really great and it gives me a great perspective now i will say i had forgotten what high school baseball looked like uh, you know, it had been a while since yeah. I had played it, and I had forgotten kind of what that mechanics and how that looks. Like, you know, we're in the middle of a game, a guy hits a ball to short, so I'm like, oh, that's an out. And I go, nope, no, that is not an out. That that is, was, yeah. We need to hit the ball back to him a lot. <laughs> yeah. Like, just keep yeah. hitting. Like, yeah. Outside of games. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> that's like, but uh, so I'd forgotten that. But, you know, it's great. I mean, those kids are awesome. I know uh, it's a great program. We've got some mutual friends that have uh, kids that are you know on the mm -hmm. team and speak highly of you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. coach and, and it's a it's a really cool staff and a really good really good environment and those kids i mean they work their tails off um they show up ready to go um you know they complain a little bit because they're 18 17 sure. and 18 years old and you have to remind them like hey stop whining yeah. it's okay you don't have problems yeah. like well, going through it now <laughs> yeah yeah <I> was <laughs> like, you, you don't have problems you know yeah. you're fine you're yeah, fine deal with it yeah. this is the worst of your problems uh -huh. dude uh -huh. i promise you're gonna be yeah. fine yeah. yeah yeah don't worry about your girlfriend she'll be okay right. like you can hang out like yes yeah. so it's it's good but it's awesome just to watch them chase their dreams and and for me 
to be around kids that have that passion and that drive um, is fulfilling to me, even as much as it was when I was doing it. So just being able to be a part of it and see that um, is super cool. And I'm very fortunate, like I said, they don't have to let me, right. um, but uh, but they do let me. So I, I was like, yeah, I'll show up. Cool. Um, and so how how did that lead into your current situation with your career, where you're at? So when I finished graduating from TCU, I uh, thought I was going to stay in coaching. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. I loved doing it. Um, I thought it was a great avenue for me. It gave me a chance to really invest in kids and, and really pour into them. Um, not just from a baseball standpoint, from just a life standpoint. And, and so I thought I was going to stay in it. Uh, unfortunately, when I graduated, we still were not at the time where they allowed the third paid assistant. Mm-hmm. So it was still the two paid, it was head coach, two paid assistants, a volunteer. Well, there wasn't an opportunity for me to stay on. Baseball is different than basketball and football, where football and basketball, you can have graduate assistants. Mm-hmm. So you can have guys that are getting their master's and still coach, and it gives them more time to kind of stay in the program and kind of figure out. Well, baseball doesn't have that. If you're Once you graduate, that's it. The position dissolves. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, okay, um, can't stay here. Wanted to stay, couldn't stay, you know, and, and, and that, was, that was tough. That was tough for me and Kirk both. Um, because I care about that program so much and still do and will always care about that program. Like, I bleed purple throughout and will do anything I can possibly do for TCU in whatever capacity they ask me to do. Um, So called, made some calls around, um, you know, wasn't going to – I had made the decision because of my life and what we had done up until that point and the fact that we were, you know, going to have our third child – I was like, we can't, I can't pick up and move and start the whole traditional, let's go to a small program, start, you know, either junior college or mid-major and kind of work your way up and all that kind of stuff. I was like, I can't do that to my family. Um, You know, because my entire, my wife's entire family lives within five minutes of us in Alito. Like my in-laws are two she, doors she's down. She's a TCU grad. As she's well. a TCU so she's, grad. She yeah, grew she's up in the area. In local yes, as well. and so all of our network is here. Her parents live two doors down from us. Like it's like we're not going to pick up. I was like, you know, no offense. Like I'm not going to go to A and M Corpus Christi sure. to start this journey. Um, you know, and so I had to make a decision to to step away. Didn't want to. You know, was was tough to do because of just because of what I realized is it wasn't necessarily the baseball part of it. It was the investment in kids. Sure. That's what I was. That's what I was yearning for. That's what I was, um, you know, passionate about. And so then I was like, okay, well, what do we do now? You know, every athlete has that question, and you have to ask yourself, all right, what do I do now? Um, so I really leaned into a lot of my mentors around TCU and, and that have been in my life, and and one of them got me connected to the CEO of the company I work for now, uh, Matt Stadler, um, for Marsh McClendon Agency. And I had never heard about insurance. All I knew about insurance was like everybody else is you got to pay it and you got to have it. Yeah. You know, I didn't read anything. You I don't want it, but you got to have yeah, it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of one of those. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's not getting cheaper. Right. Uh, you know, so it's like I saw I had known about it, but he was like, hey, you know, go sit down with Matt, have a conversation with him, just share about, you know, you and what you're passionate about and what you what you do. And he'll tell you if this fits. Um, so I met with Matt. Um, we had probably sat down for about two hours and. And I was like, hey, this is how I am. You know, I'm a, not a transactional person. I want to invest in people. I want to feel, you know, that I'm able to give them something to better their lives, you know, and can I do that? You know, I have kids. I want to be around. You know, to me, the most important job I have every day is being a father. That, that's right. it. Absolutely. Like, that's, that is, down. like, everything else is secondary, right? right? My, my job in this world is to raise three incredibly kind loving um girls and if i don't do that everything else is super a... competitive <laughs> yeah 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 because you are one of the most competitive person i've ever met yeah whether uh, people realize that or not i promise he is <laughs> yeah uh they they're, they're we're starting to see the sparks they're they're coming through but uh but that's my job right and so i was like you know that's important to me i'm not going to i've spent so much my wife away from my kids I have to be in their sure. lives. I have to. And, and so, and I poured that, you know, poured my heart out to Matt and was just like, this is how I operate. You know, I want to be in, I want to have relationships with people. I want to feel like I'm serving people. I want to be able to, to have that kind of, um, you know, ability to do that as well as the autonomy to be a dad and be around my kids. And, and I was like, does that work? And, and it was, I was point blank. I was like, Hey, does that work? Yeah. And he goes, hundred percent. That's us. He yeah. said, that's what we do. Yeah. He said, you, that's literally what this job is. He said, this job is one where you get what you want out of it. You put everything you want into it. You get back what you want out of it, but it also gives you the ability to do the things that you're passionate about. And, and he always talks about it is this is a lifestyle career. Mm-hmm. You can create whatever lifestyle you want in this career. 
right yeah, there's you no work 24 7 but you don't necessarily you don't have to you don't have to you can it, you you put in your time and you and you and you give the effort that you want and then you can get yourself to a place where you have you know the ability to do what you want right. um you know and, and so it was really just a uh, family oriented yeah <clears throat> and, it, and it's basically just like hey you know this is how it works you've lived in this environment go put the numbers on the board and then you're good to go and so i was like well i fit i know that life so i understand that but it's not in a sense the same where i am having the ability to actually help people and and that's what i you know try to impress upon anyone that i talk to is that hey this is not some necessary evil right like this is the difference between you getting to continue the dream that you have or having to close the doors right if this is not handled right that could be a reality yeah. You could pour your life's work into this, and then it could all be gone in, in an instant. Yeah. And I said, so that's the way I approach with people. And also, for me, it's like I get to pick the people that I want to be with, not necessarily the businesses that I want to do, but I get to pick the people that sure. I want to be with. Because for me, it's all about partnerships. It's not – this isn't a transaction. Okay. As, as, and, and unfortunately, you know, some people operate that way. But for me, I don't. And it's just like, hey, I'm looking for partnerships. I'm looking for people that, yeah, I get to know you and your life. I get to know, you know, what are your kids doing? What are you doing? What What is the things that you are right. in, uh, passionate about? And how can we help right. continue that? And so it's awesome. Um, it's a great career. Um, very fortunate, talk, like I said. Talk to me a little bit about what all Marsh, I mean, all the different types of insurances you guys do. I know there's, yeah. there's quite a bit. Yeah. So we are, so uh, Marsh McClendon Agency um, is our parent company is Marsh, um, Big Marsh. And so Big Marsh is actually the largest broker in the world. Right. Um, they're going after the Fortune 100s, Fortune 250s. They're, they're, you know, they're handling the Coca-Colas, the Pennzoils of the world. That's what they're doing. Well, they decided, um, a little, you know, I can't remember, five, six, seven years ago, that the middle market um, was one that they wanted to, there's a lot of business in the middle market that they couldn't go after or they weren't built to, to handle. Um, and so they decided, hey, we're going to, you know, we're going to get into the middle market. Well, you know, typically there's two ways to do it. One, you can start from the ground up, try to grassroots it, build it out, or you can find really successful places and, you know, acquire those and then kind of give them the tools they need to continue to work. And so they did the latter. Um, you know, they created the MMA, which is built for the middle market. And, and then our region specifically, they've just been a, on, um, they've acquired these really, really good local firms and then given us tools. And so our approach is one is, is hey, you're going to have a local person. You're going to see me at the grocery store. You're going to see me out at the fields. You're going to see me doing all this stuff. But I've got global reach, right. and that's what that's what we do. So we're we're a full stop shop. Um, we have, have handle all property and casualty lines, handle all benefits lines, personal lines, um, you know, for high net worth individuals, and also you know, four hundred one k retirement plans. We have all that. So we're we're able to handle pretty much any kind of uh, insurance that comes into mm -hmm. whether it commercial or personal, um, you know, but with the notion that it's something like you're going to see me face to face. Right. You're going to know who I am. You're going to be personable. Yeah, you're going to know me and I'm going to know you and it's not going to just be hey, I'm I'm calling you from wherever. Here's some numbers, here's a list of stuff that we're going to do and No, it's it's right. going to be how do we how do we walk through this and again, like I said, how do I make sure that your passions and the things that you want to do and the things you want to achieve in life, how do you continue to do those? And so that's the kind of the approach we take and and I think it's a great one. Um, and it's one that, you know, people seem to be receptive to. I think we're, as a society, we're moving back to, hey, we got to get away from just how can I, how can it help me? Right. How can it benefit me to, right. how can I help you? Yeah. And, and that part of, um. Because it know, did get away from there for a while. It was there, it got away from, everybody's like, I don't have time for that. Just send me something else. And I think the realization is people realize that uh, that's that, not good. I mean, it's not working. We're getting screwed. You know, the, the difference is, is yeah, why would you, you know, if you don't, if you and I don't have a relationship, what's to stop you from going somewhere else? Right. Yeah. Truly. Like, if I, I can give you everything you want and the, the first mistake I make or the first time that the market turns and it's not pretty, uh, what's to stop you? Yeah, and you ignore it. I mean, it's. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's and so it's like, it's a point of like, no, I want to be in a level and, and the approach that I take is that, I'm going to be so transparent with people and willing to say the things that potentially may get me fired. Sure. But you're going to be because honest. it's about you. It's right. not about me. Right. You know, I can't I can't take this job and be and be worried about self-preservation because if I am, I'm never going to be I'm never going to be able to do the things right. that I want to do, which is be able to invest in my community and continue to make it thrive. So I have to be willing to say something that may get me Pack. I mean, sure. that's and that, that's the reality of it. But at the end of the day, at least you know 
that you're 100 percent going to get transparency from, from me even if it's stuff that you don't want to hear and i don't want to say but you can't deny the fact that at least you know where where, it, where we are right yep makes sense mm -hmm. well very cool well anybody uh listening to this you know feel free reach out to me matt uh we'll get you taken care of i mean yep. just got you covered you guys worldwide how many just real quick how many employees you guys have you can think of off the top of your head oh uh, we are i would say in tot total for for mma we're talking over ten thousand employees yeah. from every region um you know we stretch coast to coast and and then then on top of that we can tap into marsh which is in every country in the world so right. We're, we're out there. Whatever you're doing, we've yeah. seen it, Got and, you and we can help. And we can help. Uh, but at the same time, at least you know you're going to be able to see me face to face. Cool. Well, awesome, buddy. I appreciate your time, and and uh, look forward to. We'll have to do this again sometime and follow up and go from there. Yeah, anytime. But, yeah, I love I love talking baseball. I love talking people. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's that that to me is is the is the world, and and I, I people I think are starting to pick up how much sports bring people together Big and how important it is to, to be able to, to have those things and, and do that. And so anytime I get a chance to, to, to talk about it or be around it, man, I'm always in. Very cool. Appreciate it, buddy. You got it. All right, man.